we will be looking at each textile sample and uh, we will be understanding not just the looms but also dyes. So, I will be today talking about dyes, patterning with dyes and the different techniques that are associated with it. But how do we deconstruct a textile? Last uh, yesterday I spoke of uh, deconstructing it materially, right? And I gave you a whole uh, systems of you know entire bunch of science and technologies how to say it. So, today we will be looking at each piece as a representative of loom, dyes, dye processes, technologies, design templates, region, community of weavers, dyers, printers, painters, washermen, etc. We will look at each piece in terms of material, processes, loom, usages and aesthetics, very important. Tactility of the cloth is important because it touches our skin and therefore it has to be comfortable. Visuality is important because it is seen and for its colors, design and aesthetics. The sample has to be seen, touched and felt by all of you. Okay. Uh, now, how are we going about it? We have the sample's name, we will give the provenance that is area or areas of production, how old and which century approximately, what kind of looms, dyes, what kind of dyes and the processes associated, the fibers, the threads, the techniques for example, the fakwa, katarwa, rafugar for Kashmiri embroidery and so on and surface embellishments, on loom embroidery like kani, brocade and off loom embroidery printed, uh, printed zardozi, cutwork and applique. Today uh, just we will speak of dyes initially because uh, we do have uh, printed and painted fabrics in our country. So, those are, these are off loom embellishments. Yesterday we did not talk about them, today we will complete the entire picture. So, dyeing process is mordant and resist to fixing yarn, uh, color to the yarn and cloth. There are two stages in the weighing process where color is fixed to the fiber, that is yarn itself like we just saw in the patola, that is you fix the color and the pattern to the yarn. Then you have which is done to the cloth, which is once it is woven, it comes off the loom. There are multiple processes used to fix the dye to the yarn and the cloth, mordant and resist. How do you get this cloth? It is not like you take the yarn or the cloth and just dip it in a dye. It does not fix. Like for some fibers, the materiality, nature of materiality of the fibers itself for, uh, determines how easily they are able to absorb color. Cotton is difficult. You have to prepare the fiber to accept color. Wool and <coughs> silk are more easily uh, colored. They, so, therefore, for cotton you have to prepare the cloth and this is done by having uh, you know mordants that is metallic salts that are used that help in the fixing of color. For example, red dye to fix red dye color, alum is used, it is a metallic salt. Alum or fit curry. Resist the area that is not to be colored as you saw in the film just now, what is not to and what I had mentioned yesterday also, what is not to be colored is tied, is closed so that it does not accept the color which is of the neighboring area. Cotton threads are tied liquid like we saw in Patola, like we saw in our Bandhani Rajasthan. Liquid wax and mud are also applied. These are the other resist mechanisms. Cloth we have uh, where we use these methods are you have Dabu which is mud resist and Thai Day of Gujarat and Rajasthan. Yarn is dyed according to the pattern through the method of mordant and resist. Uh, the film only showed the resist, it did not show, we were not able to see it, the rest of the film where there is mordanting. That is how we are preparing specific areas through uh, these metallic salts to so that uh, color is absorbed very easily. The technique is called decut. It, it is considered to have magical properties due to the patterning of the yarn itself. Uh, it was easier for communities across the world to accept, you know, yarn, uh, cloths to be dyed. But to have that on the yarn itself, the pattern to be on the yarn itself was magical and it is across the world. That is why ikat across the world where the single uh, ikat or double ikat is so much valued. Modern metallic salts uh, that help to absorb dyes, pitkari and alum, it is areas applied with alum absorb alizarin dye, red dye when put in a dye bar. Natural dyes were made and used like black for kasimi.
Okay. Uh, natural dyes were made in use like black kasimi, uh, including for our patola, uh, which is made from fermented iron, jaggery, you know, waste iron that you have, you know, uh, that is iron pieces that are lying around, red from che, madder, al, etc. Indigo from uh, tephrosia purpurea and other uh, varieties of that particular plant. Making of the dyes using natural resources, typically they are ground and they are boiled and you know, uh, that is how they are made. Today replaced by chemical powders. Fixing of colors and patterns through techniques, block printing, tie dyeing like Rajasthan, hand painted like our Kalamkari including our Matani Pachedi, the cloth of the goddess and just by simple dyeing. Each region has developed its own set of identity markers. They were patterns, colors, aesthetics, Ajrak, Bagh, Dabu, Bagru, Sanganer, and chains have distinctive aesthetics, patterns, and colors that identify them. Block printing, Gujarat block printing is an old and continuing uh, tradition. Uh, it is traded both west and east. In Fustat, Egypt, uh, they were block printed fragments of Gujarat coarse cloth. This is about 14th century common era. This is a coarse cotton cloth which is block printed and which is found in the garbage dump of Fustat city near Cairo, near uh, in Egypt. Uh, there are many more fragments that have been found. This is another one. Please note the trefoil pattern. We have only partly visible. This is a very common pattern which is even used in prints that were exported to Southeast Asia. We have the bust of the priest, Mohenjadaro priest, which had the trefoil pattern that we saw yesterday. Now, Southeast Asia also we had, uh, you know, uh, 15th century. This is what went to Southeast Asia. One of, look at these del incredible figures. There were other figures like this, figurative blocks that were sent. And these are much valued in Southeast Asia. I'm showing these figures because these are unusual. And uh, besides just the regular prints that you have, these went to Southeast Asia. Now, block printing is off loom embellishment on cloth. Uh, yesterday, I mentioned the different sets of science and technology. The first set is that of wooden block making. That is patterned wooden block making. I am not going into major details. I'll just use the keystone, just the touch, you know, major points I will touch. Wooden blocks that have patterns incised on them. There's a science and technology on block making. Uh, you have specific kinds of wood only are used. You have specific set of implements that are used to incise uh, the pattern. There are basically two kinds of blocks. Gud is something which is uh, uh, is the outline and that is one big block. This is a double block actually and uh, we have uh, then the other detailed blocks that you have that is within the outline how much of detailing you want as well as how much of color that you want we have uh, that is called as rake. We typically have uh, only one or two rake pieces because the more detailing you do, the more complex it gets in terms of uh, managing the colors, in terms of managing the dyeing process. So uh, we have the process of printing, preparation now we have come to the cloth. It is how do you prepare the cloth to receive the dye? Cotton fibers have to be prepared to absorb the dye. Bleaching the cloth is the first thing and it, uh, this thing, cloth is soaked in cold water and then it is soaked for a long time and then it is beaten like the washerman beats on the stone and the impurities are removed. Then the cloth is treated with dung. Dung would vary, uh, methods uh, would vary. You can have a sheep dung, for, uh, uh, camel dung for uh, ajrak, you can have sheep dung for uh, kalamkari, you can, and cow dung and buffalo dung you can have. And you can also have goat dung for dabu. So you have different kinds of dung which are available in different places that are used and at some places you even have oil that is uh, mixed, castor oil or any other oil that is uh, there. Like for Tilia Rumal you have, uh, you know, uh, till oil, sesame oil that is used. So this is to make the fibers soft and absorbent to receive the dye. 
Now, we have seen how it is printing has to be done and it is done over successive stages. First black outline is put and then you have different colors. So when you're going to put a red color, you're going to have a paste of alum and lime and so on and which is then printed. The block is uh, absorbs the color and it is printed. And then it is, the cloth is boiled in uh, alizarin dye bar and the areas that are covered with alum become red. So repeated uh, washing, repeated sun drying is essential. Without repeated sun drying, without having free flowing water, so when you, after each time you put it in a dye bath and you take it out, uh, you have to put it out in the sun. And uh, you have to wash it also because the excess dye has to be discharged. Only what is required will remain in the cloth, excess dye. Just, that's why you need flowing water so the dye does not stay down in the on the floor, on the bed of the river, but it flows away. So resist I've already mentioned. Now there are different methods like mixture of lime and gum arabica is used in Ajra. Mud from river tanks is used in Dabo in um, Rajasthan. This is Ajrak that we have. This is a contemporary piece that we have of Ajrak. Again, uh, please note that this is the trefoil motif they have uh, picked up from the trade cloths that went to Southeast Asia and to uh, the Gulf, to Cairo. The picture is not too good and because it was, uh, this is photographed in, uh, in not very good conditions. So each tradition ha is uh, associated with, you know, with the specific place and design vocabulary aesthetics and set of process. Ajarak design vocabulary colors. Um, I'll show you the piece now. Uh, please come, one of you. Uh, please handle all of this. Check. Open it up. Okay. I'll be speaking so that you can have a look at it. This particular piece is silk, of course. And uh, if you notice, the color is indigo and madder. And then you have black. These are, now you can uh, touch it and see. And please circulate it and it can go. You can sit it, you can spread it there and sit. All of you, please come and touch it and see. I'll be talking about it. So this particular design, vocabulary and colors, Ajrak is made typically like this. You have a specific design vocabulary and a, pardon? No, this is not mushroom silk, but now they are making in mushroom silk also. Please come down or because you all of you will be uh, touching it. This is simply mulberry silk. Typically this is done and the reason I brought this also is that uh, Ajrak has basically two colors. One is blue, the other is red. Blue is associated with uh, summer and red is associated with winter. So you have the Maldhari shepherds and so on, typical. So they would have two sets made. One with the blue and the other with the red. So those guys will, with the, they'll have the turban and then they, the long cloth which is used as a turban and as, as a shawl or whatever is covering. And then they have the lungi, the lower uh, cloth that they wear. So uh, in fact, uh, earlier what they used to do was, they used to do one, dye one side in blue and the other side in red. All this was in cotton, thick cotton, handloom cotton. So when winter came, he'll put on the red side out and when summer came, he'll put the blue side out. So it was meant to kept cool. And back then, uh, we had dyes, organic dyes which are used, natural dyes which are healthy. Indigo, you know, from uh, Tephrosia purpurea and other uh, plants of that name, of that species. And we had red from madder, manji. So they were all very healthy and very, you know, very good. So these are the two colors, dhup chao they call it. But these are the two colors that were commonly used. So the moment you see this, you say this is Ajak. 
today there is a lot of mix and match so ajrak actually came from sind gujarat today's gujarat and back then sind they were all contiguous areas but uh, the people who do this work they say we came from sind and to gujarat for whatever reasons and this some went to rajasthan and some are here in uh, dhamadka in gujarat now they have gone and formed a new place called ajrakpur and that's because of water in dhamadka water had dried up because of uh, irrigation through tube wells and so on uh, so they went and looked for a newer place a newer village called they named it ajrakpur where they pump out water and they do the traditional the river has run dry the small rivulet that was going there to sustain them had run dry because over ha harvesting of the water so or provenance a specific process there is a and a specific design vocabulary you have beautiful uh, uh, you know uh, designs in this uh, which distinguish you know who wears what in that area we also have the other set of block printing is that of this is bag okay there are only two bag is in madhya pradesh they too say that they also came from uh, sindh and so on and they migrated for famine or persecution and so on this is its design two color palette that's a white three color palette that is a, yesterday we spoke of how bleaching was perfected and all that that's because the third the colored white is a color of the cloth so if you do not bleach the cloth properly and you don't remove its impurities then it will be muddy and all that that white will white the color of the cloth becomes like a color like red and black so it transforms through bleaching process into a white color not a white cloth but a white color so bleaching gives that notion of color to this so it has red which is again made traditionally from madder and majit and so on or may all whatever red natural sources that were available so and black came from kasini that i mentioned from fermented iron in some places sugarcane uh, jaggery is used in some places palm jaggery is used but this is the color palette vocabulary they fortunately have not yet altered this color palette this has still continued so this is bag in ajrak and we are finding newer colors uh, what we saw in patola we are finding newer designs and newer colors but that is you know times that of today now blocks are common in both bag uh, and uh, ajrak as well as in uh, machli patnam kalamkari we'll come to that now there is an interdependence of communities printers weavers suppliers of materials such as dung how will you get dung so the camel herders and the printers ajrak printers have a synergy has a symbiotic relationship they wait for those camel herders to bring their dung and they, then they will make clothing for the camel herders you see so there is a or the cloth suppliers weavers whom they get they'll make the cloth the clothing for them printed and given so there is a good synergy there uh dabo is in rajasthan and mud from tanks is used as resist this is ajrak this on the left side is the uh, block on the right side is the design the process the first process they have done is they have uh, washed it you see the water body there at the back and you see this plain field for block printing to be done you need spaces you need facilities so water bodies you have banks where you can dry these uh, cloth on this side is hara again a natural tannin agent this is termina comes from this is a fruit of terminalia chebula which grows wild in the central indian forest and has a pretty uh, fairly widespread it has numerous properties but here it is ground pow powdered and boiled this is hara or harada that you call and the cloth gets a little yellowish tinge and it prepares the cloth to receive the dye and also to soften the fibers
on your this side you have camel dung here you have uh, this is in Ajrakpur where because of uh, water shortage you have tanks that have been built you see a series of tanks you can see water flowing from the top tank to below and to below and finally it is discharged and cloths are being washed so this is an imitation of flowing water where cloth is boiled or bo uh, boiled and dipped in the uh, in color it's all you have these copper vessels that are used both for ajrak and both and also for dabu and you have that bhatti the furnace and you have these huge copper pots which are sunk into the on the top you have you have fire here here on top sits a huge vessel a copper vessel typically because copper does not react to uh, these dyes whether natural or chemical so uh, and this is where they are dyeing putting the printed patterned cloths this is an indigo dye what they fold the cloth and then they dip it in and take it out and dip it in and take it out so there's a process for that I spoke of mud resist dabu here you have uh, you know mud that is there uh, the, it is uh, with lime and uh, you know it's made into a fine paste the block is dipped in the paste and it is printed so that becomes a resist then this cloth is taken and dipped in indigo dye vat so rest of the surrounding area is all indigo except the area you see this white that is where you had a pattern it with mud gum arabica and lime you know paste so that is your pattern so the white of the cloth that is the bleaching is important it becomes a color here not just as a white cloth but becomes a color this too is dabu this is the red dabu that they call but just a variation in terms of color patterns and so on we have chins kalamkari this is uh, coromandel coast India was very much famous for this it went everywhere east west and so on uh, it was from east it went to Southeast Asia South Asia and from there it was traded to Japan and Philippines and so on it went to Persia and Europe and from Europe it was traded to USA it was used both as furnishing as well as uh, for clothing now this is still an old and continuing practice in uh, Coromandel Coast in South India. Machli Patnam in Andhra Pradesh is the northernmost practice and Tanjavur in Tamil Nadu was its southernmost region. That is the range that it had. And uh, there were other centers like Palakollu and others and Pulikat along the coast, but that is the range. The process is modern and resist and use a full fat buffalo milk which enabled the cloth to absorb color and to soften it okay uh, it was originally hand painted and the first tradition was that it was hand painted i have brought yardage sample this is from machli patna this this particular thing was called as chins okay this is of course modern and of course this is chemical but uh, in different designs i'll show you you know uh, different designs where different patterns for Southeast Asia and for uh, uh, Persia and for you know USA were sent. So the process of printing is similar again blocks were made. Now block making tradition here in Machli Patnam came only in 17th century and this was because they were making for Persian markets that is the Golconda Sultanate had very close link with Persian royalty and Persian kingdom. So there was a, yesterday I spoke about the political and economic angle as embedded in the textile. So because of that courtly linkages, a trade was there. These cloths were exported there according to their designs. So there, they had a tradition, Persia had a tradition of the call as ghalamkars and so on. And they, artisans, they came down with their designs like Jainamas, you know prayer mats and they brought their blocks so that is how block printing came to Machli Patnam in South India it didn't come from Gujarat 
but it came from Persia. And then, uh, but the hand painting still continued. It did not disappear. This is a Persian Ghalamkari piece. I just brought this to show you. You will see a similarity in terms of the booties that you have, the mango booties. This is uh, some Persian uh, mela happened in Delhi. So I went and got this as a sample. Now for both hand painted and block printed uh, Kalamkari, that is both these kinds of prints and as well as uh, mythological narratives is the same. This is actually designed, this is uh, in Rijks Museum, Rijks Museum in Netherlands. This is a lady's coat, but notice a pattern. It is like, it is just perfectly done. There is a perfect symmetry and this happened because they sent the cut pattern of the coat to Machri Patna and they said design so that a design sits perfectly on this. So if you look closely, there are very minor flaws, you know, where you do the stitching and so on, it looks perfectly symmetrical. Yesterday I mentioned about the Gethwa loom doing Namavali according to the cut pattern of, uh, you know, uh, the client's measurement and how the tamali, the holy names were woven on that according to the size of the customer. We have a similar situation here too. This is very common because they were really appreciating uh, chins. They called it ch sits. This is a wall hanging that was commissioned by uh, Europeans. This is another pattern. This is a natural color which is much light. So you see a design repertoire of chins is emerging. This is a painting of a lady wearing chins. Uh, she's a British lady. Look at the off-white. So you had preferences of different regions had their own preferences. An off-white background with red. Some had, you know, the red uh, background with, you know, uh, different color designs. This is a long coat, which people, and uh, inside that a smaller coat, which is worn. So these were all, these are details of, uh, you know, designs. This is a Persian market. This is, uh, this is a mehrab. This is a mehrab. This is used as a, a prayer mat, actually. And also as a hanging, it can, used in both ways. And this particular is called as the pandu. This. You have peacocks here and you have the tree of life. Again, this is, I'm sorry for the poor quality of this because I had to photograph it in not very good conditions. So these were exported to Persia. And this is how the Persian, this thing where you have that booty coming in and all that. Yes. This is for the Persian market. The, at the bottom of it is a hanging. At the bottom there is a, a you know, torn out Islamic script. So we don't know what it was. I want to highlight here how complicated it is. It is both hand block printed and also hand painted. Okay. This is the gad that you would call the outline. But you have these details that are hand painted. You see how many details are there? This is about just about 6 inches in height, 6 to 8 inches in height, this entire this gad. That is all. But you see these details. You have these, uh, you know, booties which are very similar to our uh, Persian booties. You have multiple booties. You have peacocks here. You have peacocks. Then you have here, you have a flower there. And you have here details, which is not possible with block prints. You can see even more in, within this, you have all these details. A smaller booty, mango booty further down. The peacocks that I had mentioned earlier are here. And you see the details of this. This is a particular flower motif that you find even in Kashmiri Kani embroidery and Kani weaving shawl. So when you have so, so much of detail, then it is not possible just with blocks. 
a lot of hand painting was also there and this continued even during the British times and they were really astonished as to what is uh, you know the extent that these craftspeople could do it. Now tie dye is Gujarat, Rajasthan and Madurai as I mentioned okay before I come to that I just want to show you the figurative you can smell the buffalo fat on this. This is a present day dupatta, kalamkari that is look at it in terms of the uh, narrative, mythological stories, narratives. If you smell this, you will have a smell that is a buffalo fat. You have here um, Ramdarbar, that is the coronation of Rama Sita. This is all hand drawn. Uh, this contemporary, earlier we, ne we never had uh, these on, you know, clothes that one would wear, but they were used as displays and bards would narrate the stories. They were used for a lot of uh, purposes, but never for clothing. But today you have, this has transformed into clothing item, where even the stories that were written on the panels are written actually in the in Telugu language script on this. So you find this beautiful uh, aesthetics of floral and birds, here I think only florals. Uh, this material is uh, Mangaligiri Dupatta cotton and on which this is again a post loom embellishment. So and then they would have drawn. There are two basic colors, the white, three basic colors, white of the cloth, red from Elizarin and black from Kasini. That's the design palette. So we come to now the tie dye resist, which is Gujarat, Rajasthan, Madurai. Uh, we yesterday we saw Pulakabandha in uh, Gupta period. We saw the images of that. Uh, that has continued and it has spread by. But uh, Gujarat and Rajasthan are well known for that. Now, people from Saurashtra migrated during uh, the Tanjore Maratha Tanjore rule in 17th century or so they migrated down and they carried their tradition of uh, tie dyeing and there it is called as in Madurai it is called as Sungri. Uh, areas that you want not to be colored are tied with cotton thread, thick cotton thread are tied. It's the same principle that we saw as in Patola except that here they use the nail of their small little finger or at times they use a particular implement. If you are doing very fine dots, they use a fine iron or whatever, you know, just to have that, get that right dimension. So we see how the migration of an art has happened. This is a sample of tie dye. This is a gharchola. This is a post loom. So the original cloth has been woven with these squares. So there is a zari and you have a fixed space where uh, you can do your design by tie dye. Okay. Now you see how much of design has been done, the kinds of patterns that have been done, right? <laughs> the bigger the area that is tie dyed, it is considered to be coarse. The smaller the dot, it is considered to be very fine. So Gujarat is supposed to have the finest because it does very fine dots, whereas Rajasthan does, you know, bigger dots. This is from Apna Gujarat. <laughs> Where are we with our samples? Uh, no, I mean seeing. Achha, that is now being circulated. Okay. No, no, fine. Keep it there. Keep it there. I just want to know what was being circulated. We come to Ikat. This was practiced in four different regions of the country. Uh, Gujarat, that is Patan. Andhra Pradesh, that is Chirala on the coastal side. And Telangana, that is the Pochampalli region, very close to Hyderabad. Uh, Odisha, Sambhalpur, Noa Patna region. Now this tie dyeing uh, I want to mention here is that uh, we saw in the film Mr. S uh, Salvi mentioning that they came from Jalna. Now back then there are two things that you have to uh, understand. 
this jalna is close to is in center is maharashtra very close to aurangabad you know that side where could have been a part of nizam's dominions in the medieval era they were all these shifting you know uh, nebulous peripheries actually now the name salvi of the weaving community is uh, also very similar to the caste name of weavers in south india called sali now you have padmasali who do the regular cotton weaving and you have the pattu sali pattu means silk so pattu salis are those who do the silk weaving okay now tradition has it lord because the sali is a very very skilled in kerala also you have the weavers called as sali so you have a common name caste name that is going sali sale or salvi the theory is that one theory is that these were actually people who went from andhra pradesh who migrated andhra pradesh is very well known for its weaving skills especially cotton weaving skills and so on so there is a theory about it that uh, you know these are the people who went and who migrated and all that there has been a lot of migration and cross migration of weavers across south india across central you know up to because they were all similar kingdoms with satvahana you know this that right from ancient times to so on see empires may change but people will continue to do their work they'll carry their work elsewhere they'll more people will come in so this is how our textile and craft traditions expand prosper if something dies in one place you know a migrant elsewhere will pick it up and things like that so the pattern and colors are put on the yarn itself through dye dye resist and modern processes this is a family thing what we saw was the tying dyeing we didn't see the dyeing process the wife the women folk typically do the dyeing they also do the warping and wefting preparing the yarn the patterning is done by the uh, the making the figure the naksha is done by the map is done by the men and then they do the weaving now in patola what we saw was that uh, was a yarn is slanted the beam is slanted the loom is slanted at 30 degrees angle and where the weaver is sitting the main weaver the loom is slanted tilted to his side the two will sit we just saw rahul next to his father came salvi came salvi is weaving and rahul will be sitting on the right now it is such mathematical precision that both warp and weft have designs have to sit perfectly you saw he had his metal prongs that he was you know doing that is his adjusting and aligning the threads that is done only there the same patola is woven in um, pochampalli andhra pradesh in telangana but they use a normal pit loom and they don't use this particular implement but they also be very good uh, double acre Patan Patola was exported to Southeast Asia and uh, at least it's been there for 12 to 14th century uh, and uh, it is considered holy and having magical properties. This is an image from a book. You see the shoulder cloths. It was so much prized. These are the shoulder cloths. Like today's stoles that you can have and these were important for every ritual, for every major ritual. They had to have it. So you have the women in Indonesia wearing these. These are some of the cloths that were, uh, you know, uh, they're part of their heirlooms, which they were you would use. The you they also made trousers for the men. So you have the local kings and queens. The kings having, you have uh, sitting against a backdrop like this. This is a, a hanging which they will hang at the back and they will dress themselves up uh, you know in the coat and uh, trousers their coats their trousers and these women with their shoulder cloths and one, if you had a patola like this you have arrived your status shoots up and it is considered magical more than anything else it was considered magical and holy like i said you having it you know uh, with you the magic of patterning and coloring the yarn itself is magical and the magic when you're weaving the pattern comes alive this is actually a 
template of patola pattern patola okay if one were to see this it has the same elephants and it also has popots part of its design vocabulary this is a garchola of gujarat now if this is a weft ikat it's a single ikat if you had a double ikat that is this wart also done then it will be a, a double ikat that will be the proper pattern patola but today because of like we saw in the film you had very few weavers and this craft was in danger of dying out so one of the salvi brothers he went to rajkot and he took it out of his family and he trained other weavers and he made it into single ikat which meant that there was faster production and that there was a continuity of the craft itself so uh, weft is like this you will see carefully the threads colored threads are going like this these colors they are not going like this but like this this is the weft ikat please have a look we come to ikat that is orisha sambalpur sambalpur is in your patna orisha at least about 15th century of common era meher weaving community they use the pitlum uh dyes traditional natural and modern are chemical it's the same of process of dyeing tie dye a uh, resist modernt threads are both cotton and silk they do both single and double ikat the highlight of this is a uh, writing in odia and devanagari script you have heard of uh, jagannath in puri every day jagannath all the three idols are clothed in a certain set of clothing uh, they also color coded one day is of one color the other day is of another color and so on but there is one piece where geeta govinda verses are woven in odia script that is unique to orissa we do not have writing being you know woven anywhere else whether it is in uh, telangana or chirala uh, or uh, even in um, uh, you know patan we do not have that we have it only in sambalpur orissa this is a very interesting piece and again unique only to that place it's made in very limited quantities this is tantric magical of a different kind this if you see this is has writing both devanagari and odia script there are also entwined snakes that is the other motif that is part of this particular sari this is called as uh, tantra bandha naga bandha sari bandhodaya is uh, binding bandha means binding bandhodaya is the process naga bandha is because in addition to this lotus you have a snake also with all symbols and all bija aksharas bija aksharas uh, energized uh, letters no reportedly this is uh, act meant as a, you know that uh, two, two lovers the lover has one lover has to decode what is the poem that is written on this So I do not have that piece. This is pieces from the Crafts Museum. So you see what are the possibilities? You are seeing same ikat. You are seeing what is the possibility in uh, one place? What is the possibility in another place? How are you extending the range? Each area is has owned it and is expanding it. I'll show you. This is the Sambalpuri ikatna. this too is a single ikat this is a weft ikat this particular piece is a chalk it is considered to be holy chalk this is uh, this particular thing is done or as a floor art so uh, this is if you notice the threads move okay this is a weft ikat and this side is also weft ikat no sorry this side is what this side is weft 
come and have a look the border is what it moves this this side this side it is palla is weft the temples that you see here is where this border is joining the cloth is the rest of the body this is termed as zameen okay this the reason i'm showing you sarees is because there is a huge diversity in sarees where you know a craft has been extended enormously uh, the same loom weaves the saree the same loom also weaves the men's dhotis but men's dhotis are not this colorful they're fairly simple they're very simple and very basic but the range extension and all the combinations permutations we find in uh, sarees that's the reason why we have so many sarees now in uh, telia roman this is another double cut tradition originally it was in chirala so if if people were to ask you know where did ikat originate was it andhra was it uh, good now they of course they have said it is central you know india jalna or whether it is odisha we really don't know but likely it is it was in andhra pradesh likely now andhra pradesh uh, there is very well known tradition of telia rumal it is double ikat and it is very mathematical and very geometrical chirala is in the coastal area of andhra pradesh and it has a specific design vocabulary till 20th century onwards it uh, fairly up to yeah early 20th century it was known as asia rumal and it was exported to south asia like burma and uh, you know south uh, it went to the gulf and so on and uh, this came to telangana sometime in 1930s or so because trade orders outside orders were so much that the chirala weavers couldn't handle it so they sent two of their people to area to this telangana area near pochampalli where they said you know if they could train and if people weavers are willing because it's a complicated weave so in process so if they were willing to do it and in one village they found success and that is how this telia rumal migrated from chirala andhra pradesh to present day telangana uh, in near hyderabad pochampalli region okay from 1960s uh, so that is one vocabulary that we have uh, then of course we have uh, for this particular uh, uh, telia rumal normal pit loom is used nothing fanciful nothing like the slanted room of the patola it is interesting that of all these ikat regions it is only patola which has its slant room a uh, slant loom okay uh, i'll show you now telia rumal this was the process of very interesting this is today 45 or 45 earlier it was woven in little smaller dimensions this used to have an oily sheen that is because they were using uh, castor or sesame oil to do and also sheep dung to cure and all it was a very long process the process again tie dye and modern resist methods that we had but this had a oily sheen which actually made it a uh, thermally uh, you know empowered cloth like in summers it will keep you cool in winters it will keep you warm this is used by labor by uh, in the region it is also used by goan fishermen they had there is a particular style of tying the tying this uh, you know um, which uh, the goan fishermen did it's designed this is like patan patola which we heard he said most complicated this is the other most complicated the designs are all geometric absolutely mathematical you cannot have a circle in this but that was beaten by rakesh thakur when he did do a circle but that was a one off effort but otherwise you have only these kind of designs 
everything is precision, everything is calculated. You, the design vocabulary is limited in this because you, because of the calculation and nature of this particular weaving, you can only do certain kinds of designs. You cannot have uh, any design that you want because it has to sit within this calculation and its framework. In Hyderabad, what happened subsequently was this began to be woven like dupattas, you know, and they were uh, further embroidered and they were worn, that was called as janini, what, seven meters or so, and they were worn by the royal women and elite women in Hyderabad during Nizam's time. This almost went out of, uh, you know, practice because uh, trade sometime in 50s or so, trade orders had stopped. You see, any craft can exist only if there is a market for it, whether it is your traditional local market or whether it is a uh, modern market and so on. So in the 1950s, Kamala Devi Chattopadhyaya, she went and then she persuaded weavers of Kochampali to weave a sari and so on, gave some advance of her own money and things like that. So to, and it continued. So Festival of India's came up and then uh, they gave a further fillip and so on. The viewers are Padmasalis for this. Now, I spoke about uh, the patola being woven, that design, the patwa being woven in uh, Telangana region, again, Pochampali region. You see, there was a tradition of ikat weaving through Telia Romal by 1930s or so. So there was already a tradition of ikat weaving in that region. Now, we do not know how or why, but we find that this kind of weaving, you see the similarity between patola and uh, this, this is a pochampali ikat. This is done in both single ikat and double ikat. Traditional patola, but Patan Potola is also weaven in Pochampali area in both single and double and that is also as good as your original Patan Potola. Uh, chemical colors are used, not natural colors, but in terms of weaving quality, it is a very close match and that is woven on the normal petrol. So you see, the same cloth, I will, you know, I really wonder, the same weaving that you have is done, one is done on a slant loom the other is done on a regular room. So that is a thought that uh, you know we really need to look into uh, as to how is it possible, whether there is a really huge qualitative difference or what. This is again a web sticker. Uh, please see the motors, the geese. Yesterday I had mentioned geese were a very popular motive. Here this particular piece has geese and it of course also has elephants. Similar kind of a repertoire is also produced in Nua Patna in Sambhalpur. I haven't brought that particular sari, but similar uh, that kind of a repertoire also exists. So we now know Ikat, the kind of range that is possible. Uh, ikat in the Telangana region is also woven as daily wear. You have cotton saris, both regular and mercerized. So it is both warp uh, and weft, both are done. Um, in textiles, you will find that in some places, maybe in a border you will have a warp ikat, but maybe in the body you will have a weft ikat, maybe in the pallu you might have a weft ikat. So double ikat means, does not just necessarily mean both of them coming together in one design only, but there could be certain sections of the sari or the cloth which has different warp and weft. Now we come to the brocade patni. Uh, this is Pratishthana. You know, you had Jalla Patola, very close by you had Patni. Pathan or, pa or Pratishthana in ancient times was 
a very well known center for brocade weaving that is back then it was cotton yesterday i mentioned how roman brides waited for these brocade cloths to come so that they could wear them and get married now this is a very intricate weave and for this pit loom which is counterbalanced is used it is double interlocking tapestry weave uh, when it migrated to yevla it was just a chatai weave it wasn't the complexity had gone down there now border and pallu are woven separately and then they are attached to the main body it's a three shuttle loom and uh, i had mentioned yesterday that uh, because of the royal the political aspect impacts the craft also this became uh, in medieval times marathas adopted this so their royal women they began wearing patni sarees nine yard patni sarees and when they expanded their kingdom this particular craft went along you had baroda you it went to chanderi then it even went to varanasi and it also went to amdavad then in south again it went to kotakota that is in mahbubnagar region so in chanderi area uh, region earlier it was also very well known center for cotton weaving through shuttle pit loom that was either counterbalanced but now fly shuttle pit loom that is counterbalanced with jala attachment is used this is the patni uh, slide that i showed yesterday today you will see this particular saree it's almost like a painting now this particular is in double interlock double twill interlock tapestry weave this is woven separately the border is woven separately and then it is attached to this border now this particular technique and this particular way this is the most complicated and typically they weave this first once this is woven your major work is over because then this is you know you're looking at uh, a simpler weaving i'm introducing a new concept you see this booties this is all patterned the zameen the field the body is patterned with small floral booties now we saw yesterday the jala attachment where i said you know warp threads are lifted specifically so that this is the extra weft that has to be inserted now wherever it is necessary warp threads only of that area are lifted thread is lifted here then a new thread supplementary weft thread is introduced and this booty is woven and it ends here then for the next booty fresh thread is introduced the booty is woven and it ends here this particular system is called as discontinuous weft supplementary weft patterning you see on the reverse there is nothing everything is the same as as in the front this concept is important because when you are looking at other brocades innovations that came in subsequently uh, those will be highlighted okay have a look this particular just hold this this particular way where the backdrop is this is uh, you know you would call it as kinha where yesterday i had mentioned that you will have uh, you know extra zari patterning against this you have these colors so it is also called as enameling you know enameling that you have in uh, rajasthan jewelry that you have enameling and meenakari it's the same principle is also used in textiles now we come to banarsi brocade uh, it was a well known cotton weaving center and silk came only in the 18th century uh, now because of widespread availability of mulberry silk uh, weaving silk weaving became much more common all kinds of looms exist in banaras because the gujarati weavers have migrated and taken their looms 
other weavers, you know, nearby. It has had because there was continuous trade, so there was continuous livelihood opportunities available. And they were very uh, proficient in capitalizing new technologies, innovations, whether it came from bulk uh, in, you know, um, uh, Uzbekistan and uh, Bukhara and or well, the Persian raw. They picked up all kinds of technologies. There was space for all of these people. So Gatwa loom, like I mentioned yesterday, the Namavali. Now Jala attached loom that produced figured cloths, including brocade too existed and still exists. Besides, you have regular looms that produce regular cloths. The modern jacquard loom will also exist. So on the one hand, you'll have the Gatwa loom, which has now been revived. And now you'll also have the modern jacquard loom. Okay, Kim Khab, yesterday I showed you an image of Kim Khab, Yasser too, and brocade with Zadi and silk existed. These are some of the, this is your Chicagar brocade. This is also your lion and this is a beautiful sari with konias. These booties are called as konias. That is a konia. You see at the edge, that is a konia. This is a palla and this is the field. And you have just a small square on both the places and you have a beautiful konia. This is your uh, arm booty, which you later on Kashmiri paste uh, and uh, French paisley. This is our brocade that I mentioned uh, that we saw yesterday and today we will see it in a, this is a wedding brocade. Uh, this is a satin base and this is just uh, zari and you have these booties you have these arm booties we have saw these in the konia there you have it's a very typical now we spoke of discontinued supplementary weft patterning now that when demand came up that became a problem earlier all booties were woven like that but because of production in a slow production uh, an innovation was made which is called as fequa. Fequa meant, I just showed you Pethni Sari, where you did not find any of this. Each booty was individual, singular. This speeded up, this innovation happened because this is a selvage, edge to edge. Now, instead of just lifting the walk, inserting a fresh supplementary weft thread at every point, what they did was, they began, fequa means throwing, they began throwing the weft, supplementary weft from selvage to selvage, selvage are the edges. This is a selvage, this is selvage, this is a selvage, from selvage to selvage. This considerably is the weaving. This happened, this innovation happened in 1950 and this kind of weaving is called as fequa. So, but the thing was you had these threads between two booties. Now, if you are using a tissue sari or a fine sari, then these will be a, an eyesore. It will take away the beauty. So, a solution was evolved. K.G. Subramaniam, the famous artist, he was with the Weaver Service Center in Varanasi. He figured out what he did was, you cut off the threads between two booties on the back. That is called as katarva. So, the weaver sell, sells it as it is to the gaddewala. Once the sale is confirmed, then the gaddewala gets a person to cut it, which means katarva. So, the person will then sit and cut it. Now, this has uh, is a huge you know, uh, innovation in terms of in keeping these traditional lives which enable faster production of these brocades. That's an innovation, Fequa and Katarwa. This is a, another kind of brocade. Uh, 
almost like in half. You have to see. We saw images like this, a lot of this yesterday, right? Men's jamas were woven in four meters long strips, thans. And they were patterned, here of course there are a lot more, but they were patterned somewhat similar. Against this gold background, you will have this delicate sprig, you know. These were done in the royal karkhanas because the royalty had to wear more beautiful jamas which you will find in miniature paintings and you will also find in museums. You know, when we go to Calico Museum, I am sure they will be having, you know, examples like this. So this particular piece symbolizes many uh, dimensions of brocade. One is the men's, this thing. The second is that you have this particular design. This is a design vocabulary. This also has this. The border, this is leher. This is the leher. This too is another leher. So again, garments could be made just with this thang that is woven. If you remove the border, visualize it as like just a piece of fabric. And this was, wo wo you know, uh, sewn as men's garments. This was done similarly with this that was done. Not this closely spaced motifs, but distantly placed motifs. So you have in this not just a sari, but a multiple designs that you have and you this too. This is almost like a tissue and uh, I would also like you to notice that at the back you have these colors that are there just this color, this color here which is here and then it is here again a part of the bud. The bud has two colors a green and a brown. You see how threads are moving. The green here is is moving. Look at the threads that are there at the back. So when you see textile, you have to see the front and the back. That will tell you uh, how it is woven, the technique. Yeah, I'll do that. This is uh, Amru. Uh, Amru or Tanchoi. Yesterday I mentioned Tanchoi. This is brocade, silk on silk. Silk threads are used here. And uh, if you have to note, see this very carefully, this is again uh, multiple weft. So much so that you will not, and it is so densely packed that you will not find any loose threads anywhere at the back because it is so densely packed with design. You will find the same design at the back too. Okay. This came from China. We do not know what looms they used, but definitely this has now been adopted by the Varanasi weavers. This is from Kanchipuram. I uh, had mentioned that how the three shuttle, how it is used to uh, weave the border separately, the palla separately. It is the same technique. This is called as Koravai. Similar technique uh, is there used in Gadwal uh, and Telangana region, which is called as Kuppadam and Adai. So you can see how the, you have threads here. That is a sign that this is a true kanchi and woven three shuttle where the body uh, is attached to the border. You can find that if you touch it and feel, you can see that there are small holes, small gaps, which means that the border is attached separately. And when the palu is attached, these threads are at the back. I 
I am showing you the diversity. This of course Kanchi Sari is a very plain Sari. The Sari that I am wearing is a Gadwal, also has the same principle. This is a cotton body and a silk border and Palla. We now come to one of the most complicated uh, uh, weaves in our country. This is a Baluchiri's again brocade. This is silk on silk. Uh, the body is used as a twisted silk whereas the patterning here is untwisted floss silk. This was uh, prevalent in 18th century, 19th century. 18th, 19th centuries, it died out almost in early 20th century. You see the figures, it's rare to have in a sari figures like this that are woven. This was drawn by Drawloom with Nakshaband. It went out, uh, these kalkas, these are kalkas. We saw those mango booties of, uh, of Banaras and so on. Uh, here too we have this particular piece is a uh, about 80s or so this is not done on the traditional draw loom with nakshabandi process or the later jala process this is a jacquard process if you are to see this the reason how you will know it is a jacquard you see these threads you see all those saris you will not have threads floating like this you see the tanchoi you see the other maroon brocade you will not find here you have threads which are floating this is a jacquard This is a story from a miniature painting, Ashtanayaka, Vasaka Sajja Nayaka. She is the lover waiting already and dressed up waiting to meet her lover. This is your Baluchiri, Murshidabad, West Bengal. This is done in the traditional draw loom and patterned with floss silk. We now come to the Central Indian tribal weaves. Yesterday I had mentioned, given you all the details. Uh, these are the coarse thick count saris. This is known as the mu or the face, one end. This is a uh, Sundarmani pata. And this is a low count cotton sari worn by the Gara Paraja and other tribals of the region, uh, Bastar of Chhattisgarh and Koraput of Odisha. We do not see it is a short width sari. Uh, the length will be about 4 meters, but otherwise, it is a short width sari. Pardon? This is just called brocade. That could be Kemkha. This is the uh, Shadika brocade. Okay. This too is, uh, I, there is, I, there is no zari in it, but I wanted to show you the, how the border and the body are attached. That's a Petani technique and which is similar technique, which is across South India. So there's a similarity of technique too. You know, how you uh, weave basically. This sari is worn in two regions, both in uh, uh, Bastar, Odisha. The weavers are similar, Panika, Mirjan. This is a Jharkhand sari. This is a sari that the groom's uh, side gifts to the bride's mother. So this is Me Lugda Pata. It's a mother-in-law sari. Okay, uh, she wears it at the wedding. It's a very prestigious sari. Uh, if you see, it is a short width, but it is about four point odd, uh, you know, uh, meters. This particular design is specific to these saris. This, this is uh, I spoke of the low uh, count or coarse cotton. This is ten count. That is per square inch. You will have 10 threads of, uh, you know, warp and 10 threads of weft. These are, these are, this is worn on the Tana loom that I showed yesterday. 
very basic low but it is so sustainable you know and each sari when i spoke to master weaver kapilishwar mahanto about korapu odisha sarees he said people are so particular about uh, you know the quality of the sarees that one particular sari has to last them at least 2 to 3 years otherwise they will not talk to these people in the heart they will come and rub they, if they see them if the cloth has torn and has not he showed me he said they'll rub their feet on the ground it's practically like your name is mud <laughs> you know the english expression so they get insulted in the heart so they're very particular that is why you have these and for common people you know clothing that lasts you for a long time is the most important you see so fine clothing is for rich people because it won't last long i'll just take just five more minutes michelle i'm after that i'll be back this is speaking of coarse count sarees they were commonly worn woven and worn yesterday i mentioned from ancient times both coarse and fine cotton were worn because coarse is your daily wear it will withstand the rough wear and tear this is a chettinar sari in south india in karaikodi tamil nadu this is this too is a coarse count cotton sari these were refashioned and repurposed uh, elitified i will say uh, into silk sarees sometime in 2003 they became a big range but these thick coarse count cotton sarees have gone out nobody is weaving them anymore now what is interesting is that if you were to see the korapu tribal sari they have two pallas do mu this too has two pallas all other regions they have only one palla but in uh, central indian they have two pallas but here in chettinad you have two pallas two pallas you can say that you could wear it either way if one side gets torn you could you know wear the other side the temples there are uh, the joining of the border and the pallu yesterday i showed you northeast india i showed you the loin loom image i couldn't get the shawl because it was too heavy but i have been able to get a shawl this is an airy silk shawl this is known as the kaziranga shawl this is woven at home and uh, you see how spectacular it is a special shawl uh, with kaziranga with those rhinos motifs you have deers okay and this is kind of a ceremonial special shawl and birds but you have airy shawl uh, which is woven plain and woven in black you know threads designs which is on loom this is on loom embroidery the kashmir i end with kashmiri cloth the sink shawls they were kani woven and embroidered uh, these are uh, weavers uh, and embroiderers embroiderers were known as rafugars this famous in ancient time fibers of wool of sheep including pashmina uh, this loom is a short loom yesterday i showed you so it was woven in multiple strips and uh, interlocking twill tapestry with naksha bandha a draw loom double interlocking twill tapestry off loom embellishment was kani embroidery done by refugars it is a major export item to the west and today too it is most coveted this is a kani embroidered pashmina shawl this is on an exhibition recently and uh, that is why i was able to photograph it please note the paisley that buta that we see this became a french paisley okay look how beautifully it is done i do not have such a fabulous piece but what i do have is a uh, today's shawl the material is synthetic wool but the embroidery is very nice you have the same paisleys here you see the dense embroidery very dense the shawl becomes heavy because of its denseness even though there is damage to the shawl the embroidery has not gone 
you see. So, I was a little uh, very lucky to get this particular shawl for, uh, for display. Notice the fine stitches. Typically, we associate fine stitches and small stitches, you know, with fragility and they will come apart and so on. But feel and look at the back, see the knots, see what kind of stitches are being used. This will give you an idea as to why, um, you know, Kashmiri shawls were so loved and prized even to this day because of this kind of an embroidery uh, and also weaving. Weaving, the Kani embroidery was done so skillfully. It was done both sides, single side and double side. They were exactly the same. You could all, there was also a time when uh, you would have this, the other side in a different color. So they would different tricks and they will have multiple colors in the same, there are different techniques of doing it and all that. So uh, weaving would have been wonderful. Today Kani weaving is done but uh, it is very expensive and like I said it is, takes a lot of time. So does the weaving done by, the embroidery done by the refugers. If you, they have to do that, imitate that kind of a Kani embroidery, it is this is, I would say, Kashmiri embroidery now because, uh, but it has very delicate and very, you know, dense embroidery, very delicate and dense. Unfortunately, the material is bad. That's a separate issue. But uh, that is, that gives us an idea, you know, as to uh, how it would have been. That's the last sample. And uh, I'm ending with a slide. I, uh, this is a Gujarati Mughal. Embroidery Gujarat. This I have not touched because again we didn't have the time and so on. But uh, this is Ari embroidery and it was patronized by the royals of Gujarat and this was a major export item. In fact, when I saw this piece again at a recent exhibition, I couldn't believe that this was embroidery. I tried taking photograph of the stitches, but it was like they were so fine that it looked as if they have been painted or you know printed you couldn't make out but I knew that that was the stitch you could make out the ridges and all that of the stitches it was so fine and this is done by Ari that is the all embroidery the cobblers who use it all to stitch it is made with that no no not that no not that it is not similar because what uh, they do, Garo, is they do it by hand and they also do it by uh, with, with Al. There are two ways of doing it. But the stitches is different. There it is satin stitch. Here it is chain stitch. It, Ari uses, this Ari uses only uh, chain stitch, mainly chain stitch it uses. But they were so fine and delicate, I cannot tell you. I have not seen such finer ones ever. And I couldn't take an appropriate, I couldn't take it because they were that fine. It required a more sophisticated camera to take. But yes, Ashdi Lilawala is using Ari to do Parsi Gara uh, saris and all that. But you do have others, a traditional, you know, hand done, satin stitch, they are doing. Okay. Thank you very much. We have come to the end.